I hope everyone had a nice holiday break, a refreshing and renewing break. Uh, it was a little short on our end, but it, I, I do feel refreshed and renewed. Uh, here at the Graham Center, we're focused on helping our students develop the mindsets and skills necessary for effective and meaningful civic engagement, public leadership, public policy implementation, and public service. With that in mind, we have two mantras that capture our approach. The first, is that if we believe in effective civic engagement, public leadership, public policy, and public service for one individual, we must believe in those principles for all individuals. We do not get to pick and choose who, believe, who we believe should be able to engage, to lead, and to serve. The second mantra follows from the first. We cannot fit all 40 to 50,000 US students inside Pew Hall. We'd get pretty crowded and cramped in here if we tried. But we want any one of those 40 to 50,000 individuals to be able to find a home here in Pew Hall should they choose to walk through those doors. So why do I begin tonight by once again affirming those principles? One year ago, we witnessed an event that horrified most of us and that struck at the very heart of those principles of effective, and I stress that word effective, civic engagement, public leadership, and public service. Being effective in these spaces means listening to and engaging constructively those with whom we might disagree. And it means developing and implementing policies that seek the betterment of our communities as a whole. While what happened one year ago took place on the national stage and was seen across the world, much of the real work of effective civic engagement, public leadership, and public service must take place at the local and state level. And it is for that reason that I'm happy for the Bob Graham Center for Public Service to host what I hope will be a productive and thoughtful discussion of what we might expect to take place in this legislative session and how the public leaders and servants of our state might seek to make meaningful contributions to the betterment of our communities and the individuals who inhabit them. Tonight, we have four panelists and a moderator, all of whom I will introduce uh, in just a moment. The moderator will lead the discussion for approximately 35 to 40 minutes. We will then have approximately 15 minutes of open Q&A, during which we will take questions from both the audience here in Pew Hall and those of you attending remotely. For those of you who are remote, please use the webinar Q&A function to pose your questions and we will be sure to get to them here. Please join me in welcoming our participants. Thank you all for being here. Florida Representative Nicholas Duran, who will join us remotely, was elected in 2016 to the Florida House of Representatives for District 112. In the legislature, Representative Duran serves as the ranking Democratic member of the Health and Human Services Committee and is on the Health Care Appropriations Subcommittee, the Appropriations Committee, Finance and Facilities Subcommittee, and the Joint Legislative Budget Committee. Over the years, he has also served in a variety of leadership roles in health care policy and community engagement. Florida State Senator Keith Perry served in the Florida House of Representatives from 2010 to 2016, and since 2016 has represented District 8, which is Alachua, Putnam, and Marion counties in the Florida Senate. His company, Perry Roofing, was awarded the 2009 Business of the Year Award for Commitment to the Environment by the Alachua County Chamber of Commerce. Perry is an active supporter of Habitat for Humanity, the Boys and Girls Club, the Dignity Project, the Reichert House, the Salvation Army, the Women's Center, and is the founding president of House of Hope. His legislative priorities include land conservation, job creation, infrastructure, education, and agriculture. Yolanda Cash Jackson is an attorney with Becker Lawyers. She is an experienced government law attorney who has established a strong reputation in the community for her leadership and commitment to civic, charitable, and, and uh, I'm sorry, professional organizations. She concentrates her practice in the area of governmental relations and has developed a proficiency in state government funding and appropriations. Ms. Jackson has excellent working relationships with several of the state's leading elected officials and policymakers. Eric Godet was named president and CEO of the Greater Cha Gainesville Chamber of Commerce in December 2018. He has served the Gainesville community for many years, working as vice president of organizational advancement for Haven Hospice and is a founding member of RTI Biologics. His previous experience includes working for Johnson & Johnson and IBM. Godet's work supports developing family-supporting jobs, improving local infrastructure, 
and revitalizing both the city's urban core and the surrounding rural communities. Tonight's event will be moderated by Mark Kaplan. Mark uh, currently serves as Vice President of Government and Community Relations for the University of Florida. He has served in a variety of leadership roles in both the public and private sector during his career, including as former Governor Jeb Bush's Chief of Staff, as Executive Director of the Florida Housing Finance Corporation, as a member of the senior leadership of Mosaic Company, and as special counsel in the office of the Speaker of the Florida House of Representatives. So we have a very diverse uh, group of, of presenters and panelists tonight in terms of their background, their interests, their experiences. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here on behalf of the Graham Center for Public Service. Mark, the podium and the microphone of yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs. Thank you all for having us here today. Uh, so we are on the eve of our annual legislative session. Uh, we have a legislature that uh, purports to be a part-time legislature meeting uh, for one session, 60 days, and this year it will start next week, next Tuesday, January the 11th. So our timing is absolutely perfect. Um, it's a little bit of a misnomer, though, because leading up to this, we've had half a dozen weeks of committee weeks and a lot of other activities that have been going on to prepare for the session that will start next week. But as we get ready for next week, maybe we can ask our panelists a little bit to just give us a sense of what to expect, what some of the, the major themes are, and what you're hoping to accomplish. Representative Duran, we're going to tempt fate with the technology here and, and start with you. Fingers crossed and good evening, uh, Mark. It's, it's going to be with you. It's going to be with uh, my esteemed panel and, and the good senator. Um, uh, yes, we start next Tuesday. Uh, and uh, I would say if you were to look at kind of where things are, um, again, here we are and we're dealing with COVID and we're still continuing to deal with COVID. So how it impacts our uh, education system, our healthcare systems, our just general government uh, will also will always be a topic du jour that we will have to be engaged with and dealing with uh, in, in session. Um, you have. Uh, a major redistricting process that has, is getting going and it's going to have to finalize itself before uh, session ends. Uh, so approving maps and dealing with that is going to be a major part of this, this session. I would say that's probably the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Uh, and, and uh, you have a host of passing the budget. We go up there. The most important thing we do uh, every session and we're constitutionally mandated to do is pass the budget. And last year's budget was the largest budget. I'd expect to see us, somewhere near and around the same uh, when it comes to passing this year's budget as well. Good. Thank you very much. So um, that, that $100 billion budget this last year um, certainly set a high water mark for our state and, and we'll, we'll set some of the tone for this year. Senator Perry, what, what, do you, what are you watching for? What should we be expecting? Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me out. I uh, look forward to a productive little evening and, and certainly a question is probably the best time to find out what's on your uh, mind and thoughts. Uh, and Nick, glad to see you here. I just left a thing with uh, Chairman Payne and Speaker Sprouse. They said, I said I was gonna come here and see you and they said to say hello. I'll say we did that remotely. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think uh, he mentioned some of the things. Redistricting is always a big, uh, big deal, big issue. Um, I think uh, this time I was involved in one before uh, in 2011 and uh, as a freshman up there, didn't have a lot of involvement. Uh, this time, uh, in a more senior leadership position, I asked for no involvement uh, in the redistricting process. And, and, and really, it's a kind of a no-win game. You, you get up there. I've already had public records request uh, seeking information for me. I've made it a point. I have a staff person here in Susie that we are not communicating with anybody about redistricting. We'll let the staff uh, work their magic do what they got to do and we're not going to be involved in all uh, there's some constitutional issues about our involvement and what limits that and uh, so I'm going to abide by that and make sure that we'll just uh, whatever cards we're dealt we'll play with that and, and see how the new districts come out I think you're going to be we've already had preliminary maps and I've even had some of my Democratic colleagues that have commented favorably on those uh, from the preliminary ones so I hope we'll see that I think um, obviously the budget as you mentioned when I first got elected, by the way, in 2010, our budget was a little over $66 billion. Last year, it was right at $100 billion. Uh, that's probably almost $10 billion more than what we maybe were expecting, and that had a lot to do with the federal money that came down. Uh, I think you'll see that budget about the same. Uh, we did not spend all of the money that we were allotted, and I think that was important to do. 
it's uh, believe me, there's a lot of hands out and there's a lot of great things to do, but you got to make sure the investment that we make is going to have an impact on the future of the state of Florida. And it's the best money well spent, whether we get it from the federal government or whether we get it from the taxpayers of the state of Florida. Uh, it's important how we allocate that money. It's also important to make sure that we do things. Uh, a program can be started by uh, a current legislation and then it's required almost by the future legislatures to fund those or make sure those are going. There's not a lot of programs that are created by the government that go away. And so it's really important that you look at in times of excess that we limit uh, what we do and, and only do what government should be doing and look at the necessities and the priorities uh, that are going to have the biggest impact on the citizens of the state of Florida. You can go through. I don't want to do it now. We can do it later. I think that, you know, we, the governor has his list of priorities that he's come out both on a budget standpoint uh, and from a policy standpoint, uh, pretty interesting things. Some things a little bit outside the normal realm of the legislator dealing with cryptocurrency. Uh, we have a pilot program that he wants to do, allowing people who are doing uh, automotive uh, sales and transactions to use blockchain technology in order to pay for that. That's kind of a new thing. Uh, for us. So you'll see some of that new technologies. Most of the stuff we do is not quite uh, on that line, but uh, just the fundamental basic things that keep the state running on a regular basis. So we'll, we'll talk about my priorities and the governor's priorities and some as we move along. We'll come back to all those. So Ms. Jackson, you and I have, we've been through a few sessions um, over the years and, yes. and you represent a lot of um, very diverse interests in Tallahassee in front of the legislature. What are you, what are you working on and what are you watching for? So uh, thank you for that question. And it's such an honor to be here in Gator country. <laughs> um, so listen, I see it a little differently uh, as a lobbyist and, and an advocate. Of, so my theme this session is show me the money, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're expecting uh, a lot of non-recurring dollars, and that's where we'll be focused. Uh, we will be seeking pilot projects. Uh, hoping that uh, some things that uh, maybe have not been able to be funded uh, previously, but because of the effect of COVID, uh, we have some uh, opportunities. Uh, infrastructure, the legislature did a, an amazing job last session uh, with things like water projects, things that we really had had some challenges in, Sadowski funds, where they did make some corrections. So we'll be looking to uh, advance that. Uh, I represent a lot of municipalities. Uh, climate change, we can say that now. We <laughs> couldn't say that you know, five or six years ago. So show me the money. We'll be looking at the opportunity to fund some of those non-recurring issues. Redistricting, um, this is my fourth, maybe third one, third one. And it makes for strange bedfellows. Uh, so although uh, the legislators don't talk about it. I can assure you that lobbyists are looking at how things are aligned. And then um, lastly, we're, we're starting to look at long-term effects of COVID, uh, whether it be the education gap, the achievement gap, um, health care, uh, the state has been resistant to expand Medicaid. Um, we may not call it that, but we may call it an extension, but we're going to have to deal with those long-term effects of COVID, those long-term costs that people still have. And so those are the kind of things that we'll be looking at from the uh, lobbyist perspective. All right, thank you. Mr. Godet, in addition to the work that you do here in the greater Gainesville community on behalf of the business community and the economy, you're very involved statewide as well. What's the business community watching for this time and what's gonna be important to you? Well, from the business community, our focus is really continuing to strengthen Florida's business climate. So we really see ourselves at a really a critical window where the rest of the nation is looking at us. Florida led the way this past year. And when we watch job growth, when we watch everything that's happening. And in Florida, we're really trying to be an attractive place for manufacturers to really differentiate ourselves and bring our nation back to that place where we're not as dependent on foreign supply chain issues. So when we look at our community today and we talk to the businesses throughout the state, there are two big challenges. One is talent. And that's a global war that's happening and everyone's gearing up to make sure that they can hire the best and the brightest and retain them in their area. The second is really supply chain. So whatever we can do as a state to really position ourselves to strengthen that and through manufacturing and create the business climate and all those issues that 
hinder us from attracting certain businesses from even investing more in their assets they have here and even bringing new ones are really some of the biggest issues. Good. Thank you. So, Ms. Jackson, um, you know, for our students in the audience and for folks watching online, how we keep up with sort of this sprint of, of what happens in 60 days and bills that are being considered and committee meetings that are happening, how do you encourage people to keep up with what's happening and, and stay on top of things in Tallahassee? This thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's exciting because each and every one of us has the opportunity to watch real time what's going on in Tallahassee. And that makes for better government, in my opinion. Uh, people can no longer hide behind, you know, not knowing what's going on. So I think, the, especially for the students, and, and we talked a little bit about the interns that we have coming up to Florida, it's very important that you get involved in the process, that we uh, make sure that you communicate with legislators um, where you live, uh, and not just <laughs> Perry, because he has all of us uh, here in Gainesville, but where you live and let them know uh, what you're thinking because it's all of us that are involved in the state and so uh, there are several websites uh, myflorida.com a very simple one uh, then all of the advocacy groups have theirs all the municipalities have theirs and certainly trade groups so there's a lot of opportunity to keep involved all right and those of you um, the Florida channel uh, yes. is is uh, you know, continually playing. It's now both online and, and on all your cable services as well. And you can, uh, you know, d depending on how you're wired, you can watch it in real time or you can, uh, you know, watch it when, um, when, yeah, when it's 2 o'clock in the morning and you're, you're hoping um, for something to lull you off to sleep sometimes. And every legislator is on social media. And every, and every legislator is on social media. <laughs> so, Representative Duran, do you want to talk a little bit about this whole notion of what it means for you to hear from people, from, from regular folks, interested citizens, and, and how you'd encourage students and others to, to stay connected to the process? Absolutely. Uh, it's a great question and something so important, I would imagine, I, I, I believe of these times is, you know, everyone... When you ask questions at a local level, you ask young students, oftentimes you walk away shocked uh, if they know who their local elected official is, who their state representative, who their congressman is. Uh, oftentimes you, you'd be a little disheartened by what you hear. And I always think that it's, uh, it's a product of us prioritizing and putting that in front of young folks to say, this is your government, uh, you have access to it. Uh, and I think it's important on us as legislators to to provide that sort of level of access. And I think when you get elected to, to public service and to uh, to to represent a district, to represent the state, uh, you you have to. It is a it's about constant communications. We don't make legislation in a vacuum. I like to say it like that. It, it's about engaging with your public, engaging with your constituents, your businesses, your uh, professionals in your area to learn and understand the issues. Uh, that are, are are driving them, but if you involve folks, if you provide an open access, an open opportunity for them to engage with you, uh, that that's a that's a critical part. So first and foremost, I always say, what we have are district offices that we uh, have the honor to to uh, sit in and and use uh, for the public good. Uh, it's not my office; it's our office. It's the, the district's office, and uh, I have to make that office as open to the public as I possibly can even in despite of what, what we're dealing with, the challenges with COVID, there are ways to do so. So us always constantly communicating, reaching out. Uh, a, lot of the public, a lot of what we do is go to events and uh, different sorts of events across the, the spectrum to kind of listen and learn and engage. Um, but uh, what I think is most important for, for young folks is to realize that we do not occupy, we're not in these silver towers with silver gates and gates where you can't get to us. Uh, if, if you can't get a hold of your legislator, your local, your, your representative, or your senator, uh, then we're not doing our jobs right. Um, so first, if you look us up, you could probably find the phone number, and you can probably get in touch with somebody who's really close to us, one of our aides, uh, and always, always feel that you have the empowerment, the opportunity to call them and give them uh, your, what you're feeling, or you can send us an email and things like that. We do read them. I read every single one of them. I, I have my team monitoring on, on the day-to-day. -day. Um, but engagement... You know, while we're up in Tallahassee, we have 60 days. We're running a sprint. It's not just about those 60 days. It's about the full year. Uh, it's about engaging with us uh, after session to sort of see what, what you saw going on, learning about what laws are, are now in place and how they're impacting your day-to-day, -day, if it's impacting your quality of life, 
uh, it, talking about it well before we go to session is quite critical and important because it helps us kind of put on our radars what we're hearing from members. So I think it's it's not just about when we're up there and we're at the microphone and we're talking about controversial bills. It's about the entire year and before us even getting there uh, that folks need to feel empowered to go and, and be a part of the process. Great. Thank you. Well put. So, Senator Perry, of the couple of thousand bills that will get filed this session, um, you've got about 30 or so, it looked like, at, at last look. Uh, that, that's, that's, yeah. It is a, um, a reasonable percentage, um, but um, we talk a little bit about some of the things that are that are high on your list of priorities coming up this session. Sure. Unfortunately, that's going to be 35 or 40 by the time tomorrow is the deadline for bill <laughs> filing. Um, it's a little, just a, real quick, on the House and the Senate, a little bit different. So the Senate has 40 members. The House has 120. Uh, they're limited to seven bills they can file. We are unlimited in our bills. Uh, we have some of my colleagues who choose not to file very many bills. I try to set a limit every year of 12, 15 bills. My aide is laughing back there because <laughs> we always get about 40 uh, bills, and that's a really a challenge for myself and for my staff to be able to do that. But, you know, we, we really look at those and try to find out what things are going to have the biggest impact on the state. So um, on a personal level, you're going to see, like I say, you're going to see thousands of bills. Last year we had 275 bills that were passed out of the thousands of bills that were filed. Uh, not a big percentage of bills get passed, and that doesn't have necessarily to do with merit. Uh, it has a lot to do just with time. Uh, there's not enough time that we can go through the process. And this past committee meetings that we've had for the last several months have been really uh, not extremely productive. And we had a special session that kind of ate into that, and we didn't have any meetings uh, but redistricting on that. So, um, and the governor out of 275 vetoed five bills out of 275. Two of those were mine. Um, so I give the governor about a 98% uh, rating, uh, certainly not 100%. No. So matter of fact, one of the bills that, that I've refiled, and, it, and I think it's one of the most important bills, although you're not going to find out about it and read about it. And as a matter of fact, uh, I would encourage, uh, especially the students in here, to go in and, and try to find some bills that aren't the big emotionally charged bills. Find some other ones that are important and learn to track those and learn the process. You'll get a little bit less of all the rhetoric and debate and the emotion out of it, and it really help you on understanding maybe the process. But the, the bill that got vetoed uh, was a pretty simple bill. It was a juvenile expunction bill, and there was a public records attachment bill that went with that. That's a pretty simple bill. It's um, Right now, if you're in the, uh, a juvenile and commit a misdemeanor crime, and the courts and the prosecutors and everybody agrees for you to go into a diversionary program, if you go to that diversionary program, you're successful in completing that, your misdemeanor record is automatically expunged. If it's a felony, it is not. And so you can have a felony record travel around with you. So you, you're 17, you stole a laptop, you did something um, and made a mistake, and everybody agrees you're going to go through a diversionary program, you do it, and now you have a felony uh, arrest record that follows you around. It can be a pretty big hindrance. Uh, for, for a lot of people. This bill will affect probably, I don't know what the number, 26, 7,000 uh, kids. And uh, the governor had a valid thing. What, what Right now you don't see people going through, and a diversionary program is not made for someone who commits a sex crime or a gun crime or something, but there's nothing prohibiting that. And so the governor had a concern that later on, who knows what prosecutor or state attorney or stuff and what they want to do. So he had a concern. It's a, it's a valid point. We've refiled that legislation, and we put forcible felonies and some other restrictions that do not allow you to even go through that. So we'll do that. My, um, my other biggest bill that I've had for uh, years now, five, six years, uh, is music and elementary education. Um, I got that passed. It's now it's th uh, this will be the third year for funding that, so we have to extend it. it COVID kind of, we finally got it passed, uh, and then COVID hit and had, had some kind of problems with making that, implementing that program. So that is a, a three-year program, kindergarten, first, second grade. We we pay if, if a school district wants to uh, implement the program, we pay them extra money. Every school district we've talked to said, give us more money, we'll implement a music program in these grades. And then the second part of the funding goes here to the University of Florida College of Education that's doing a study. And that study is both a qualitative and quantitative study. So we're not only looking at uh, test scores and vocabulary and some other things that, that uh, you would find through other studies, but also, and the reason we pulled counties around uh, Latchville County to implement this is that the students can go into the schools, the grad students conducting the study, they can 
talk to the teachers, they can watch the students perform, they can talk to administrators, and they can see if these kids who are coming in so far behind academically also are coming in behind socially. And so what we want to do and see of the study, and I think you're going to find it uh, to be true, we'll see, but uh, that these kids assimilate into the classroom uh, far greater than they would in any other realm. So I don't think it's a silver bullet, but I think it's a, a, a big deal. I asked uh, on the floor in debate uh, on the Senate, I asked everybody if we could spend about $150 per child per year uh, and improve IQ scores by seven points, would we do it? And what you find is kids with music in the background have about an average of uh, seven point IQ advantage. So, and, and why I think this is a huge deal, if you take kids at four years of age, you take children with a vocabulary of 12, 1300 words up to a high end of about 2,500 words. So almost a two to one ratio of vocabulary. By the time they reach six in two years, you've seen the lower end uh, move up about 4,000 words or so, you've seen a high end of about 16,000 word vocabulary. So we've had a two year gap from four to six that we've had an explosion in a certain segment of our society on just their words, their vocabulary of what they know. We know from a lot of data and research that the kids who are that far behind never catch up. The majority of them never catch up. I chair criminal and civil justice appropriations. I've been involved with criminal and civil justice issues for most of my adult life. I can tell you there's common denominators in the criminal justice system. Um, most of us in this room, if we had the background that a lot of these kids go through and the trauma and the issues they go through, there's a lot of us that would be exactly in their place too. So we've got to do something at the front end of what are we going to do to change the direction of some of these children, not try to do it on the the end where we're taking adults and saying, okay, we want to jump. And I say we don't forget about adults and stuff, but we really got to do some things on the front end. And again, music and elementary education, the arts has been pushed out of the education world, not just in Florida or United States, around the world. That is absolutely not a priority, and I think it needs to be a priority. So that's, I got a 40 other bills. We all talk about those, but those are a couple of my priorities. Well, as a proud alumnus of the Gator Band, I'm, I'm always happy to end on, a, on something music related. So, so thank you for that. It's also a great segue. So, so Mr. Godet, as we think about the business community and what the Chamber is doing, what the Florida Chamber is doing, um, there's, there's a project called the Prosperity Initiative that, that you folks have been working on. Could you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, uh, you're, thanks. Thank you, Mark. Uh, absolutely. The Prosperity Initiative um, that came out of the Florida Foundation is really an incredible program where you can see a lot of chambers around the state are really working to make a huge change. And one of the components that's really uh, significant with it that really uh, struck me was how they broke it down into zip codes. And through these zip codes, you can see the zip codes in different communities and different counties where you're really having the challenge and where people are struggling. And so through this, we're working to really make a difference in our community. And so for the Florida Chamber to have this prosperity initiative and the ability to break it down on a um, micro level here helps us identify those zip codes that are in need, but really look at the services. We found out a lot of these services that are needed are very similar throughout the state of Florida. And many of them are dealing with children and needing resources and help. So uh, early childhood education is a key component, but we also have other initiatives where we have to focus on the adults. They may need some reskilling, upskilling for job training, and we as a community are gonna have to provide those wraparound services to help lift them and change those dynamics. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. It's a, it's, a, it's a great program and you're doing some impactful work. So one of the questions I get a lot from, from students, and, and I suspect many of the students here have similar questions is, you know, beyond just sort of following what's happening this session, um, how do I get involved? What do I, if I want to do what you do, how do I do that? And I'd love to have each of you just share a little bit about your story of what brought you to this work in politics and public policy. So, Ms. Jackson, maybe I'll start with you. Thank you. I, I always love that question because I, um, as a student here at University of Florida, I was a journalism major uh, with a minor in marketing, and I wanted to be a buyer. So there you go. <laughs> I'm not a buyer. But um, I, I stayed in Gainesville and decided to go to law school. And it was there at law school that I began to understand the connectivity between public policy and really how it affects the way that we live and understand the real meaning of advocacy. And uh, But 
as competitive as you know the institution is, uh, I decided that I would go to a major law firm, and uh, I was the first black woman who that law firm had hired. It's the oldest law firm in Florida, and there were two black women there, myself and the woman that worked in the kitchen. Mm. And uh, we became fast friends, and uh, I, I played litigator for about nine years, uh, trying to fit into a box that was defined by success. Uh, how you define success as a University of Florida uh, graduate from uh, law school and going to a major law firm. Well, that didn't work. But my friends started running for office, and they asked me if I would help them out, and I just couldn't let go uh, because not only did I help them out in their campaigns, but help them out in the community. And it was that community work that really intrigued me about uh, advocacy and lobbying. And then um, a friend of mine told me that there was a law firm that was looking to expand their lobbying practice. I had no idea that there weren't other six foot black women running around Tallahassee being lobbyists. <laughs> so, uh, but that turned out to be yesterday I celebrated 23 years wow. uh, as a, a government affairs uh, professional. Our lobbying practice has grown from myself and um, the gentleman that hired me to now almost 20, including an office in D.C. and uh, local and state lobbying. So how do you get involved? How do you do it? Um, I think you can still, I still believe in following your passion. I still believe that when you do what you love, that it's not work at all. I love this work. And uh, you don't have to be Democrat. You don't have to be Republican. You just have to believe that the work that you do makes a difference. So I would employ um, <laughs> young people that are trying to figure it out to uh, just follow your passion. And don't listen to what your parents said. to go. They, they wanted me to be a teacher. So that didn't work either. So follow your passion. Uh, awesome. That would be the advice I'd give. Thank you. Senator Perry, um, would you like to share your story of, of how you wound up here? Sure. Um, and, so, so mine's probably a little different than, than some. Uh, my father was a professor at the University of Florida for 38 years, chaired clinical psychology the last part of his career. Uh, I barely made it through high school. Uh, so um, my brother and sister graduated from here, another sister graduated from North Carolina. I was uh, the kid always looking out the window, wanted to do other things. So I started a little business when I got out of high school, started a roofing company. I just knew the trade. It was just something to get by. I thought eventually I'll go and go to college. Uh, you you uh, start a company, you hire a friend, you buy a truck, hire a couple more friends, buy a couple more trucks, and 45 years later, uh, my resume is pretty short. Um, I've had two jobs serving, run, running my business and, uh, and then serving the legislature. So this is back in 2010. The s sitting state senator at the time, who I have a seat, Steve Ulrich, who was also the sheriff here before that, called me up, wanted to go to lunch. Uh, I said, yeah, we'll meet for lunch. And he said, I think you should run for office. The, we have term limits. The uh, Speaker of the House at the time, Larry Creedle out of Ocala, was being termed out. And he said, there's an open seat and you ought to run. And I said, Thank you for calling me, and absolutely, 100% not. Uh, and there were two real compelling reasons not to run. One is my business, we had a housing crash in 2007 and 8. I have a business, we had four other offices around the state, five total. I had 220 employees. I, I had gone from 220 employees to about 70 employees in a year and a half. I was in debt. I was losing money. Uh, we kept cutting pay, and then we um, kept not making as much money. It was a pretty bad time to be in the construction world. And then my daughters uh, were 8 and 11, who now is, one of them is a senior here, getting her master's in business. My other daughter graduated in biochemistry here a couple of years ago. But to be a father of an 8 and 11-year-old, to have a struggling business, I, I don't think so. Um, but they, the senator kept pushing me to think about it, and I told some other people, and they were encouraged me to think, so I so gave it a lot of thought. And what really became the compelling reasons not to run uh, kind of became the compelling reasons to run. Uh, to be in business for that long, to be in blue collar, there's not a lot of blue collar people in Tallahassee uh, that are run up there, to be, to be in a business and start any kind of business uh, as a young age and see all the struggles that you go through, the rewards you can get, but the struggles you have to. Um, I thought being in that environment gave me a little different perspective than, than maybe some of my colleagues did. And then the other thing with my daughters, uh, so 
when I was their age in Gainesville growing up, 95, 7, 8 percent, maybe 99 percent of every single business in Gainesville was owned by an individual. All businesses. We had a J.C. Penney's down now, downtown, and we had a Belk Lindsay's. Uh, I think they were just building one Publix. Maybe it was just about to come in. Uh, but everything was owned by an individual. All the pharmacies, all the hardware stores, everything was owned. How come in a 40, 50 year period we've seen a total shift where young people are going to graduate and are you going to go start a business? Probably not. Are you going to go work for a business? Yeah. Uh, where are your chances of success in using the skills and talents that you have? Right now, um, in fact, the music and education on being a creative environment, I think that if you think about an industry, uh, right now, the biggest industries in the United States don't want creative people. They may talk about it. They don't. Uh, they want very highly skilled people to do specific tasks. You can't have a company with 300,000 employees and have 300,000 creative people. You have a creative class, and we've almost moved into an aristocratic kind of society. Most people in the biggest industries in the United States that are in the upper echelon come from certain families and from certain schools. And we see that in banking and insurance. We see that in the court systems. I think Clarence Thomas was the first Supreme Court justice to take a clerk somewhere else than one of the top Ivy League schools, and that he took a clerk from the University of Florida here. But we've moved into that society, and this is what young people have to think about. And, you can, and this is why I encourage you to think about some of the other bills besides the really emotionally charged bills that everybody talks about. But think about what are the other things? What are the accumulation of small bills? It wasn't one bill that got passed 50 years ago that said, you're going to be a pharmacy student, you're going to graduate with your degree, but you're not going to have your own pharmacy. It wasn't one bill that got passed. It was a series of bills and bills and bills and policies from a legal standpoint and a regulatory standpoint that now prohibit most young people from doing what I think they should be doing. They should be allowed. You want to go work for a large corporation, have at it. But by, right now it's by default, not because it's a choice. And these are huge issues, and we could probably talk for an hour or more about a litany of things that if you were aware of that we're doing uh, that either help you or limit you in your future. And so long answer, I looked at my daughters and what kind of opportunities I had as a kid coming out of high school, being able to start a business. My business will do $22 million in revenue uh, this year. It's a pretty successful business for a roofing company. Um, but, but I had that opportunity. What is my daughters going to have? And that became, again, the compelling reasons not to run uh, turned out to be the compelling reasons to run. And that's why we can talk later about some of the minor things that I'm working on that I'm hoping are going to help you as a student once you graduate to say, okay, now I have more opportunities this, this time than, than, than less. Good, thank you. And, and um, get your questions ready because after Representative Duran and Mr. Godet tell their stories, we're going to open it up to the audience here and to the audience online as well. Um, Representative Duran, will you tell us your story? Sure, sure. It's uh, enjoying hearing these stories as well. Uh, so for me, uh, I uh, went to law school as well. I, I'm, a, I'm a proud graduate of the University of Florida. Uh, did public relations major. I wish I would have uh, been more active, had, had shown more academic prowess and, and graduate much higher GPA. Uh, but I graduated nonetheless. My parents were both from the University of Florida as well. Uh, and, and so I was proud to, to graduate there. I went to law school, went to a private law school up in New York and uh, accumulated some pretty good student debt. So I had to go practice at a large law firm to uh, pay down my student debt and student loans. Uh, and I quickly realized while I was there, it wasn't really what I wanted to do. Uh, my mom was a, a public school teacher for 33 years. I think if she was not the uh, largest, loudest advocate for her two children, her two sons. Uh, it was always for her two, her students and her class. She taught a what they used to call uh, SLD uh, back in those days uh, classes and taught with a lot of children who had uh, physical and and uh, mental uh, disabilities and uh, you know dealing with 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 that student body who oftentimes uh, back then were not often getting the kind of resources that were necessary and needed for them. My mom would bang her chest and, 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 and really ensure that those kids uh, had a voice and had someone with them. Uh, so she left an impression with me that uh, it's, uh, it's not just about you, it's about those around you in your community. Uh, and so I was talking to uh, a, a close friend, a family friend uh, who introduced me to a, a gentleman named Dave Lawrence, another 
powerhouse alumni from the University of Florida. Uh, Dave Lawrence uh, is, uh, was former publisher of the Miami Herald, retired, uh, and then went on to do public service and continues to do public service uh, and ensuring that every child uh, has the, uh, the opportunity for a high quality volunteer pre-kindergarten experience and just early childhood education and investment in children. Uh, when you go to Tallahassee, one of the things you used to say to me is make sure children are your number one priority. So I learned a lot from Dave uh, and, and Dave used to say to me, Nick, um, you, what, when's next? When, what are you going to do? And I would say, I like being in the background, Dave. I like making these organizations work for you. So he goes, no, 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 Nick. Uh, I want you to think about this. I want you to realize that at some point you all have to take the mantle and speak up for folks. Uh, he, he really kind of instilled in me, one, uh, surround yourself with people you do, you do not know and be humble in what you do and do not know and try to uh, empower yourselves by those far smarter than you uh, and listen and learn. And if there's a, a, a someone who taught me the art of surrounding yourself with people from all walks of life, from all uh, political ideals, uh, it was Dave Lawrence. It helps you really kind of uh, learn and, and, and more importantly, kind of really understand what makes someone tick so you can work with them uh, and find those common grounds. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to go and lead an organization that implemented the Affordable Care Act in the state of Florida, uh, oversaw that program, uh, and then I started to be engaged by uh, individuals wanting me to, to run for office. I didn't want to run for any district. Uh, you know, what happened was uh, the district where my parents, uh, both my mom and dad, came from Columbia about 54, 55 years ago with their respective families and settled in Miami, uh, where we are now, Coconut Grove, Coral Gables area uh, that it opened up and uh, to be to have the opportunity to represent that district where my family began their American story uh, to start and build uh, what their dreams were uh, was was so awesome and uh, so I, I dived in and for me it's always been about uh, public service about access to since the world that I worked in was about early childhood education and children and when I heard the good senator say it I heard him say it, we have to invest in the front end not in the back end if we really want to see these priorities. Uh, and that's a Dave Lawrence mantra, if I've ever heard one. Um, that that is, is kind of where it came. I didn't expect myself to be in, in, the, in that seat, didn't expect myself to be uh, presented with those opportunities. But uh, as they came, you sort of see what happens in front of you. I started to have my, my first son when I first ran for office and my daughter was on the way. Uh, but when you have this awesome uh, opportunity to, to to be able to be a parent uh, and and uh, and inflect on on their life and ensure and see them and their friends and their little little ones as well, uh, it, it has certainly kind of been an impression on me and led me to where I wanted to focus in on uh, and the issues and priorities in my life. Fantastic, thank you, and Mr. Goodday. You've had a little bit of a different sort of path to this role as a representative and an advocate. Will you share that with us? Absolutely, Mark. Uh, thank you. So uh, my background is one where I actually grew up in the Bahamas and um, family, a very entrepreneurial family, a lot of businesses, a lot of stuff around there. And so I grew up with that whole passion for growth and business. And I was very fortunate to get a job here at uh, UF in the Department of Orthopedics. And in it, we had this uh, incredible uh, chairman, um, Dr. Petty, who, you know, hired all of us that founded RTI and ExactTech, but there's this whole vision on, and you know, a small group talking about, we're gonna go public and do all this kind of stuff. And I'm sitting there thinking they must have lost their mind. And uh, just a handful of us in there, but the power of vision is something that's really incredible. And even though I was thinking that, hey, we were all working to make it happen. And as we were moving forward with this vision, it's, um, we realized we were dealing with some challenges and we were growing, I mean, really fast. And we had incredible products and it was just an incredible time. And I started hearing stuff from folks at University of Florida telling me, you know, you need to go do this, join the chamber, get active. Do this. I joined the local chamber. Well, you need to get involved with the state if you really want to make a difference, you know, and started volunteering and getting involved with it. And there was a uh, local senator that uh, one of the first graduates out of the University of Florida's first dental school. And um, he's like, Eric, you guys are doing good stuff, but hey, you need to be at the table or you're going to be on the menu. And um, I'm like, okay, now you guys may have heard that before, but that was a wake up call for me. And uh, as a son of a dentist, you know, it really resonated with me. And, and I realized we needed to make a difference. And so I started looking around. 
And I noticed like Mississippi had these tax credits in manufacturing, Georgia had them, Alabama, but we didn't have them. And so I realized our legislators wanted to hear from individuals who were doing the work and share the differences in how we could improve. And it was received, it was very receptive and we were very fortunate. So we got the manufacturing credits, we got the tax credit, the research tax credit. And then as a state, we were suffering from a lot of the challenges with interstate transplant, because that's what we were doing as our business. And so organs and tissues, um, transplant and stuff. And so um, I went to DC and started working with uh, you know, um, the US chamber and that kind of stuff. And I got selected to work on a, the anatomical gift act and it was committed to change the the ability to move um, organs and tissues across states and that kind of stuff and it really hit me on how important and powerful because now we're saving lives that have been lost in florida without the ability to move this and so i truly just got engaged excited and i see yolanda she'd be making all kind of things happening up there but hey, we would agree <laughs> on terms of whatever we could do to help you out, you know? And uh, so, hey, like she said, there are too many of us out there, but it was so important. And I think you need to find that passion, but it woke something up inside of me, Mark, that really did. I have to stay on top of this. And we, as a business community, and my staff can tell you, I realized I was very myopic where we were just building a business and growing there. And we weren't focusing on the community as a whole. And getting involved was really taking care of the community as a whole. What are the initiatives that are important to our community, to our university, to what's going on? It got me out of that box where I was being selfish in myself and really became more collective to work on what's important for our community, for our state, for our nation, and how to help. And now you're all about community. So thank you for that. Uh, so there's a microphone uh, that's being passed around the room. Um, please raise your hand for questions. We'll bring you the mic. I would ask that you um, wait uh, until the mic gets to you so that folks online can hear you as well. Um, Karen, there's one up here. Um, thank you all for um, spending the time. It's really appreciative and uh, I definitely appreciate the comments. My question is for, I guess, uh, both legislators or leg legislators, which is uh, the pandemic took a hit on public education, specifically when kids were put in school, when you had to do Zoom for hours on end, and it took a hit on parents, teachers, and educators. So what's gonna be the legislative priority in education? That way the public education system in Florida does not regress. Representative Duran, you wanna start? Sure, uh, what, a, what a, a good question and, uh, you know, this is something that I think, um, I, I know it full well. Uh, I know it full well because I have two young kids in elementary school and my son who's in the fifth grade now, uh, but when the pandemic kicked in was in fourth, my daughter was in kindergarten and the stark contrast between a kindergartner and a fourth grader in terms of incorporating Zoom into how they learn and their learning experiments is vastly different. So I saw the struggles in my own house family. I became a principal a teacher, my, 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 my wife, myself, everybody. So yes, it was exhausting. Teachers as well, the, the dance and the moves that they had to make. Look, I think one of the most important things that, that is, is realized and, and we're working towards is just that we, we need our kids in school. And um, they are in school. My kids are in school. I think most families here would agree. Uh, it's not only just about the school, uh, but that learning experience, the immersive experience that's inv involved with school uh, is there, are, are we doing it? Uh, you know, I think there, you can have the conversations about if folks are feeling like it's being done safely or not, but I think it's done and we're, we're in school. And if you have them, if your children are, uh, have that opportunity, it's there. Uh, so one is how do we uh, deal with, with um, education in general is we, uh, on a year to year, like we said, we make the budget. Uh, I always say the budget is a reflection of priorities. I think you've seen the last two years, this last year, and you'll probably see it this year, is a large in, in investment in education, in education in a couple of ways. One, we prioritize the safety of our, stu of our students to, so they have a safe learning environment. Two, we prioritize the, uh, that we have great teachers and that we're taking care of our teachers. And I think over the last two years, you will see that, the, that that's come in raises. 
Um, and it's, it's something that we got to continue to, to, to be focused on. I come from Miami data, I live in Miami, a quality of life cost of living is incredibly expensive. So it's always a struggle of how do you do this and do this uh, to account for every county's cost of living. Uh, and then I think the other is behavioral mental health access points. We have really started to prioritize schools in, in helping. I think we still have a long ways to go uh, on this level. Uh, it is to ensure that that there is that access point. There is no turnaway zone for somebody who may need uh, to have um, behavioral mental health service or services and supports. So I think for us, those are three important areas. Um, learning loss is something we got to keep in mind. Uh, but the more our kids, I, I, I firmly believe this. My kids are both, I think children in general are resilient, resilient. And I've seen it not only in my, my, two, my two kids, but my families. Uh, the children around us, we just need to make sure that we provide them the platform and the supports. And I think that we're, you'll see that over the next two years that we're doing that. We should be doing that. Uh, and if we do find those places where there's a gaps, um, you know, it's, it's incumbent on us to speak, speak our minds and speak up. All right. Thank you, Senator Perry. Yeah, I, I think we have years that we're going to be seeing some negative consequences of what's happened. Um, you know, it's hard to predict. You, we can try to predict, but we'll see those play out. I think that we're fortunate in the state of Florida that our schools have been open a lot longer than most places. Uh, this is kind of bizarre. I was at an event down in Ocala about a month ago, and uh, I met two ladies. And um, this guy says, you got to meet these ladies. I was at a political event. And I meet these ladies, and they look like my wife. Uh, they were from Canada. They took they had to get out of the country. They couldn't do it legally. They took a helicopter. This is like out of a movie or a TV show, right? They took a helicopter across the border to a waiting car and they drove their kids. These two mothers drove all their kids down to Florida so they could get a regular education. They left their husbands, their homes, all of their belongings, most of the stuff. They could only take a certain amount of stuff. And they came down to the state of Florida so their kids could get an education. I thought, I'm telling you, when I'm meeting these ladies, I'm thinking this is camp. This isn't real. This is almost bizarro world that we're going through this. But that's the way it is in Canada, and we've certainly seen that in in other states around the nation. And if you think about um, who gets hurt the most, are the kids who uh, are already disadvantaged. So parents, single family uh, homes with a mother or father or whoever that's raising kids that cannot sit at home, you're not going to have like. Nick, and that's great. And, and if, if we had to do it, my family would make it through that because my wife could stay at home and she could help with our kids. But you can't do that in a, in a lot of situations. And you can't have an elementary school kid by themselves at home learning Zoom. Not going to happen. And you're going to see, I'm telling you, we're going to see a huge problem down the road. And we've seen Chicago just came up, says we're not going to teach in person right now. I never did understand this. And I'm going to get a little political here. If you think about children and the risk they have from COVID, it is about non-existent. It's immeasurable compared to other things, school drowning, I mean, uh, drownings in swimming pools, all the other things that there's a chance in life that things aren't going to go your way. But the fact that a kid would sit seriously ill or die from COVID is almost non-existent. It's immeasurable. Yet what we've seen, the debate we've seen that teachers, parents, other people, administrators have said, we're going to force this on kids to protect us. I don't know when the society shifted that adults now need to be protected from children versus adults protecting the children. I think it's, uh, it's a, we, we, yeah, I can get a little emotional about it because I think it is so insane and wrong in the education model to tell kids that they are not going to go to school when their chances are so, so minuscule. So I think you're going to see a problem. I'm going to tell you another, get a little political too, and that is mask. Mask on children is not necessary. I'm not sure masks work at all. We can debate that for quite a while. It's a, it's a, a sub-microscopic particle that is about 2,000 times smaller than the opening in your cloth mask now. 2,000 times smaller. Um, I have mosquitoes at my house. I didn't put up a chain link fence to stop them. Uh, but to have children and learning and visually and understanding, I was just down in Fort McCoy down in Ocala at one of these music classes, and I'm watching the teacher communicate to first graders and the under, trying to understand and see her facial expressions and understand and see these other kids that also, by the way, I think are being taught that, hey, life is so dangerous that you got to watch out when you're next to another kid. you got to be so careful. and We've got to do all these precautions. I think it's unfortunate. Again, 
maybe I'm being overblown on these things, but I think kids are going to suffer for years to come on some of the policies that we put in place to protect us as adults, not protect the children. So hopefully Florida's a different state. You can like that or not like that. Uh, the ladies in Canada like that. Um, but Florida's different. We're not going to have that. We passed special session on certain things dealing with COVID, especially with education and, and what's going to be required and what parents and what we just, what we did, it's called a parental bill of rights. And we kind of modified that and made it even stronger. We're saying that if you have children, you're going to make a decision for your child. Some administrator and some school board is not going to make decisions for your children uh, when it comes to this. So again, People like that, people don't like it. I like the fact that the state of Florida is open for business, it's open for schools. I did a job, a remodel downtown on, on a building and um, I remember for the first six months, I'm going there every day and there was a, it started out, there's a daycare next to it. It was offensive, you can't see the kids, but there's an area. And uh, to hear kids screaming and shouting and laughing and playing, but for a six month period, not to hear that. No kids, no laughing, no fun. And then the day that they open back up, the first thing you hear is kids screaming and laughing and having fun. It was so encouraging for me to hear young children playing with each other and having a good time out in the playground and not being taught that uh, somehow we have to live in, in fear. And we've, we've done that. We, we, it's amazing. Uh, and in my own family, we have this. We have people who, who are living in such fear and almost dire consequence of, of the future. And it's, it's unfortunate, I think, but we don't want to put it on our children. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for the question. We have a question online. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, and I'm actually going to combine a couple of questions that, that have come in, one of which is from um, one of our UF students who will be joining us in Tallahassee as part of the Tallahassee internship program. So this is really open to the panel, um, but goes back to a comment that Senator Perry made about the number of bills that are filed each session. So how does the legislature come together to decide which bills to focus on and which will wait for another session. And also um, for the panel, which bills that you've seen filed so far do you think might have bipartisan support in the session that begins next week? All right, well, so maybe I'll start with Ms. Jackson on this one because you, you, you represent a variety of interests. So if you'd like to start and then we can go from there. I think, I think one of the things that will have bipartisan support is additional dollars for infrastructure. I think we all agree that no matter where we live, what party we are a part of, that the infrastructure is needed uh, to uh, help with the quality of life. So I think that will be um, something that everybody will get uh, behind. I think um, the answer to the question as to which bills are heard, uh, that gets to be political. Uh, I think the legislature does a good job on some, a good example last session was the maternal health uh, bill. That was just an unbelievable bipartisan support of about of close to $100 million um, on both sides of the aisle. It was just remarkable. And that happens more often than people want to admit. We've done it a number of times, um, but it is political. We live in a political society and uh, those that are make the rules rule. And so generally, um, you know, bills are, are, are um, sometimes done partisan, but for the most part, good legislation gets through no matter who uh, is, is leading it. And Senator? you have to, you know, work together. Yeah, Senator? Yeah, real quick. So I chair one committee, Criminal and Civil Justice Appropriations Committees. When you file a bill, the Rules Committee takes that bill and they'll reference it to the committees that, that are appropriate. If it's an education bill, it's going to go through K through 12 or higher ed or whatever. If there's a fiscal on that, it can go through the uh, higher ed uh, appropriations. And then it may go to the full appropriations uh, as well. So who chairs those committees? It's my prerogative to put what bills on my committee when we meet, which ones are, are up. So, so I go through all the ones that are presented to me. I try to look at the ones that are going to have the biggest impact. What are you going to have a good chance of passing, period? What's running in the House? If the bill not, doesn't have a House sponsor, I'm not going to waste time that we're going to do it on the Senate. So, so it's done that way. I'd like to bipartisan just real quick on that. Um, being a Republican in Gainesville can be a little difficult uh, sometimes. I uh, get prejudged. When I ran for the first Senate race, I remember the Gainesville Sun made a statement to me at an interview that we had 
uh, about uh, partisan politics. And I don't, it was just a kind of a side comment they made. So what I did is I went and pulled up all the bills. I'd been in office for six years at the time. I pulled all of the bills that I personally had run and passed when I was in the House. And you're seeing 98% of my bills are 120 to zero, you know, 115 to five. I had two or three bills that I had more uh, Republicans vote against than I did Democrats. I take it down to the Gainesville Sun. I give it to the editor. It was funny when he's looking at all my bills right off the website, and he's like, holy cow. You know, you would think that if you were in journalism, you ran a newspaper, you might know uh, what goes on. But what the reality is, most of the bills, overwhelming, are, are bipartisan bills. Overwhelming. Again, that's what I was telling you. You're going to read the Gainesville Sun, and you're going to read about the ones that News isn't in business to give you news. It's in the business to make money, and controversy makes more money than, than good news. So they're going to bring up these controversial issues, and you're going to read about two or three or four bills out of 275 that got passed, and they're going to try to make those what Tallahassee is about. Uh, it's not. We get along. Yolanda, she works on both sides of the aisle, has to, and she'll tell you that we have a really good cordial relationship, um, and, and we really get a lot of really good policy done. So Representative Duran, different different chamber, different party. Uh, sure. How would you answer? Yeah, it, it, and there's some good good input there. I, I would say one, look at the politics. The realities of it is, you know, if, if Republicans control the House, they control the Senate, they control the governor's office. Uh, a lot of priorities will be uh, come through uh, from that the party in power, and it's just a part of of part of life. That's the part of political consequence, right? Um, the other half to this is, you know, like like the the senator just said, you have the House, you have the Senate, uh, different paths in the House. You you have 120 members, uh, all of them with six bills, a lot of bills, and 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 a little bit of time. Uh, and so, oftentimes, you look at how much what the fiscal reality of the bill might be, uh, what kind of trajectory it has in the House. Does it, like he said, if the, if it has a different uh, sort of thinking in the Senate, it, it is not, you know, it, it really kind of has to kind of find almost like a perfect pathway to get through both the House and Senate oftentimes. Um, and most of the time, uh, as the Senator said, uh, the good majority of bills we pass are partisan, are, are, are nonpartisan. We, we're all bipartisan and it's, and it's usually a unanimous, uh, you know, on our side, 120 uh, or the total number of, of members in the, in the chamber that day voting um, in favor of them. Now I, I'll talk about one bill this session that I think I'm I'm very optimistic about, and it's one that the senator is actually running, uh, and it's a one that he has he's working on with uh, a, a Democratic representative from my from my from the House uh, that deals with kid care, the Florida House Florida Healthy Kids Kid Care Program, and ensuring uh, the realities of 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 the minimum wage uh, that's increasing uh, because of the constitutional amendment passing uh, last session last electoral cycle. Uh, we have impacts to our social services programs, uh, impacts that could unintended uh, consequences to some of those programs in terms of eligibility. Uh, making a family, a mother, uh, make a decision as to whether or not she should take a $3 raise um, and because now she may no longer have the eligibility to uh, for her premium assistance to purchase health care for her, kill, her kids. Uh, there is a bill that is fixing that. It's kind of creating a glide path and the senator uh, is leading the charge on his end and our side uh, Representative Robin Bartleman, a Democrat, is has been working on it, and I've been proud to kind of help consult her on these issues. I've been working on kid care for many years, uh, but to see that that kind of bill is something that you'll see on both ends with a lot of support, uh, and, and it helps a lot of families uh, in our state. Uh, and something that, like the like the senator says, oftentimes it's these large controversial ones that uh, that take up the limelight, uh, but these are often the ones that really kind of move the needle. Uh, for Floridians, and and to see something like that, I think is is a positive step and move forward in, in the right direction. Great, thank you. So we could keep doing this for a while, but we've got time for one more question over here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, my question is for either or both legislators. So, as you know, Florida has a Surgeon General, Joseph Ladapo who has stirred up a lot of controversy. He said that hydroxychloroquine is good for treating COVID. And among other things, he said that exercising and losing weight has the same efficacy for not getting COVID as vaccines. So um, I just wanna know what the legislature is going to do to keep him accountable in this session. 
so maybe Senator Perry, you want to just talk a little bit about the Senate's role in the confirmation process? Sure. And, and I don't believe the Surgeon General said that exercise and vaccines are, are the same. I, that, that's a misquote on him. Um, I've met with him on multiple occasions. He's very He's controversial because he speaks his mind. I personally like him a lot, and I think he's a great asset to the state of Florida. Uh, that cuts the grain with other people, uh, but he's super smart. He's Harvard graduate. He's been on faculty in UCL Berkeley or uh, University of Southern, yeah, UCLA. Uh, this guy is an extremely talented, extremely smart pe person. Now, what he does, he goes against the grain. That means he gets the press, you know, uh, mischaracterize him, misquotes him, unfortunately. So if you read some of those quotes and we can talk about it later, I'd talk about it in person about, about that, but uh, he's not going to, he's not going to be in the mainstream at all, uh, but he's going to speak his mind. And like I say, he's the, one of the brightest people I've ever personally met in my 12 years. There will be a confirmation process and you cannot uh, serve the governor will appoint and then we'll go through the Senate. That's part of our role is to confirm. There'll be that process that will come up and then there'll be time for public comment there will be time to listen to the debate. Uh, there'll be time to, to do that and then make a rational uh, decision and the Senate will do that. And uh, there's a couple of my conservative colleagues that he's upset too. So, uh, but, um, but we'll see how the confirmation process goes out. But I personally think he's uh, you know, one of the brightest people I've ever met. And I've been, been up there 12 years and I've met a lot of people, so. Yeah, thank you. So we'll close with one last question um, from an online um, for one of our online participants. Okay, um, as legislators, how do you ensure all voices of your constituency are heard? And what challenges have you faced that made it easier or more difficult for members of your constituency to be heard and actively participate during the pandemic? Representative Duran, do you wanna start? Yes, uh, so I, uh, I would say first, you know, the pandemic has certainly presented challenges in terms of at the beginning anyhow of us getting together and in person, oftentimes uh, you would have a lot more meetings in your district office and dealing with that, but leveraging technology has allowed us to kind of do it like this. I'm here with you today uh, in a way that, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, we probably wouldn't have, have been doing this. Um, I think it's it's a matter of this. One, I, I, want, I, want, to, I want to kind of firmly in, instill in everyone's minds that legislative session, while it's 60 days between January next Tuesday until March and, and, and you know that's not that's not just when you can engage you have to engage year round and I think uh, we are we have to work to ensure that folks can know when to get a hold of us talk to us and then work with us on those issues so I think that that's something I want to keep pushing to folks is you know our our work isn't just for those 60 days this is part-time like like the senator I run a business and I have I have that, but I all, this is a part of what I've signed up and committed myself to. So I make time and I have a great team of people who help me uh, engage with our constituency. So one, don't, don't just think that uh, what's going on in Tallahassee is the, is, is the end all be all. Uh, we are working in our districts, we're learning, listening, and that's a part of what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, and, and it's then uh, when it's less noisy, uh, when we're not hearing from a bunch of lobbyists and a bunch of advocates all in one in place where we're doing uh, 10, 15 minute round robin meetings during the day. Uh, well, at home, we're, we have meaningful, very in-depth in conversations and meetings and listening and learning that. So uh, I'd encourage folks to think about that. Uh, when's, when's the right time to strike, when you can have a meaningful and engaging conversation. Uh, I think that's, that's a part of what, what's important is letting folks know that that's the case. Uh, and, and it's always, uh, I, I, I don't feel like I'm, I'm 100% confident that I'm always getting everyone's voice in, but you just got to like in everything else, you, you try your hardest and you try to learn and, and try to incorporate as much as you can and listen and learn from as many as you can. Uh, and that's just a part of the process. All right, thank you. Senator Perry, anything you'd add? Uh, sure, there's campaigns. Campaigns, uh, I'm one of the most difficult seats that you can run in. And there's a lot of money spent, a lot of negative stuff. And it's, uh, it's a, a trying time to be in a campaign. My goal is as soon as the campaign is over, that I've been successful in one that I represent everybody in that district, people who held signs for, for my opponent, people who gave money, that's bygone, that's a campaign, that's different than, than the process now and we move forward and I try to meet with every single person and we'll do that. This is what I would encourage you guys to do, uh, like the representative said, to get in touch with us in, in, in session, in a six day session, uh, appreciate you reading all your emails. We get a controversial thing, I, we can get a thousand emails in a day. 
a thousand emails in one day about one topic. You know, we can't respond to that. And so your impact is going to be very limited in that period of time. But prior to session, during the off session, we, you call up, you meet with us, and, and we'll meet with you. And as he said, again, if your representative or your senator doesn't have time for you, it's time for you to get another senator, another representative, because we're here to serve you. And we need to reach out. doesn't mean we can take every single person and react, but it's a, I'll give you one more last thing. If you want to be an impact, if you want to have, you should get involved with the bill. You can't wait till something, this is when most people get involved with the bill, when it directly affects them. When it directly affects them, they get involved and then they try to make an impact in the process. And it's very difficult because they don't know the process. They don't have 20 plus years experience in doing this as a professional. So if you got involved a little bit before, even on the peripheral, not on an emotional bill again, uh, so you can learn the process and understand it. The last thing, if you ever work on someone's campaign, if you worked on a congressional campaign, if you volunteered, and I'm not talking about a lot, if you worked an hour a week for a congressperson that's running for office, assuming they win, uh, guess what? You're probably going to have their cell phone number. When people are campaigning, we're very responsive. You'll find all of my colleagues <laughs> Uh, are very responsive in campaign mode. And that's when you can build a relationship with people and you can, you can go around to different campaigns. You can look at what you can do to volunteer. So first you can be an advocate and help people get elected that you care about or think about. Try not to do it on a party line, try to meet the people and decide who you wanna support. But then if you do that, if you have, again, now you've worked on a campaign, you call your congressman up and say, guess who? And they'll know who you are. Um, and so um, you don't do things just for that personal benefit, but it does build a relationship like you'll never have an opportunity. Plus, it'll give you a chance to work on a campaign and see how other things do and how people get elected. It's an incredible experience. You don't have to have an experience to start. You just got to call up somebody that's running for office and say, hey, I want to help. What can I do? Um, and the last thing on that, don't wait for people to tell you what to do. Most people who run uh, campaigns, and Nick, when your first campaign, you didn't know what you were doing. I ran my campaign. I didn't know what I was doing. People come to me, want to help. I don't know what to tell them even to do. Uh, so most of us get involved in this. We don't have political experience. So it's up to you to be active and engaged and use your skills, talents, figure out what needs to be done. Uh, and you can have an impetus in that. And you can have a big impact. You can help people get a, a, a room this size. You could, you, could, uh, you could run a state house race and uh, maybe swing a house race. Uh, you could certainly swing a, a city commission race or a county commission race. This room, a group of this working together would do that. So the impact of a few people makes a big difference and, uh, and then you build relationships and learn. All right, thank you. That's a, a great note to close on. So I'll give you three websites to close with. Um, visit uh, throughout session, myfloridahouse.gov, visit flsenate.gov and visit thefloridachannel.org. Between the three of those, you should be able to really keep your, your finger on the pulse of what's happening in and around the legislative session. Of course, please continue to watch the Bob Graham Center's webpage uh, for other events that will come up. Uh, we're grateful to you for being here tonight. And if you could please help me thank our panelists for being here tonight as well.